of a view, and we see, you'll see a few forest plots that are this. For those of you not familiar with the forest plot, we have uh, on this one nine separate subgroups. There's the overall result, which is the diamond. This is the line of no difference. And if the diamond crosses the line of no difference, we would say, well, we haven't got statistical proof. That result could still be chance. So this diamond isn't touching the line of no difference. So we might say, overall, this trial shows there's a benefit of treatment. But once we break the trial up into these nine subgroups, in none of those subgroups was it statistically significant. So those of you who are clinicians, if a patient was sitting in front of you with a clear characteristic that placed them in subgroup five, would the treatment work for them? Do you believe this result, which says, I really don't know if it works for that subgroup? Or do you believe this result, which says, when everything is combined, something's going on? And you might look at it and you might think, well, actually, no, I should believe the subgroup result. But if this was age, and I said to you, how might we subgroup on age? Well, we might subgroup into decades, which is what this might be. But then I could subgroup by actual years. Then I could subgroup, subgroup by years and months. And before you know it, every little subgroup of my trial is tiny, too small to answer the question. Yet the patient sitting in front of you is 37 years and three months old. You don't want to rummage around in the trial for other, 30, other people of the same age. So it's a, it's a big problem if we say, well, I need to, to identify, does it work for this patient? Should we believe the average or should we believe the subgroup? When it looks like this. Then we have to say to ourselves, well, can, where can bias creep in? Is it better to have pre-specified the subgroup? So is it best just to say, well, I don't really know what's going to happen with this data. Let's have a good look around inside it. We want to pre-specify them. We want to be saying in advance, what are we going to look at? And ideally, we want to be saying in advance, what are we going to look at and why? What are we expecting? Because that's going to strengthen ourselves against the statistical probability that we'll see something, we'll see something that we want to believe and we're wrong. And it's terrible as a researcher, it'll be terrible to say this thing works when it really doesn't. So we've got to test something else now. We've got to say to ourselves now, how robust are our predictions? How good are we at predicting things in advance? So we need another prop. And this prop Again, uh, familiarity with the context of randomized trials, sometimes what we might do in a, in a randomized trial is we might use envelopes. So we shuffle the cards, we put them in envelopes, and we draw the envelopes out one by one to decide you know, who receives what. And as long as we follow good procedures, then that's not too much of a problem. So we have here an envelope. I have here, and it's a very big envelope because we do very big trials. So for very big trials, you need very big envelopes. Just, uh, you know, you'll, yeah. So this envelope is a very special envelope. It's a sort of almost, it's a magic envelope. Because this envelope can hypnotize people. This envelope is going to hypnotize somebody, not on the front row, because the front row have sort of done their bit for the moment, <laughs> but a bit further back. Who thinks they're susceptible to being hypnotized? Can I hypnotize you? Do you think I could? I think I might be able to. <laughs> can you tell me what's on the other side of this envelope? Think for it. Can you tell me what's on the other side of this envelope? Uh, pardon? Something written. Something written, yeah. What's written on the other side of this envelope? Can you tell me what's on the other side of this envelope? I need honesty, not you. No, I'm not written on the other side of this envelope. No, I'm not written on it. Can you tell me what's on the other side of this envelope? You? Thank you. <laughs> I hypnotized him. I'm not very good, not very good. Thank you. No. Believe it? Don't believe it? <laughs> now we have to think about what's inside the envelope. So when we're doing a randomized trial, what we really want to avoid happening is that people will sort of steam the envelope over and have a little look inside and say, oh, I don't like that for this patient. So what we have to think about now for inside this envelope, there is something inside this envelope, a few things inside this envelope. I need you to tell me a farm animal. 
Shout out the, the, a farm animal. Cow. Cow. Okay, cow. Let's have another go. Sheep. Pig. Pig. Look, it's all three. <laughs> it's a sheep, or it's a cow, or it's a pig. Depends on how you decide to look at it. So, all three of you were right. Because I've interpreted the outcome the way I wish to interpret the outcome. We're all looking at the same data, but it's a bit of a strange looking uh, creature, but it's close enough. So we have to do another one where maybe I can't manipulate as easily. You know, maybe uh, this isn't going to be uh, quite as easy to do. So what I need to know now is a number between one and five. Someone shout out a number between one and five. Three or four. Which one should we go with? Three. You sure you want to go with three? Sure. Should we go with three or should we go with four? Three? <laughs> I've what, what in here? <laughs> no, no, I be three! <laughs> <laughs> I did not have th it was on three. Three. So, we have to think about what's all that mean? Well, that all means being careful with our subgroup analyses. It means, did you know the answer before you asked the question? Did I know what was written on the other side of that envelope? Did you know what was written on the other side of that envelope? Or did it just by asking the question... And then asking the question often enough, you get the answer you want and say, well, that's the way I'm going to analyze it. That's what I'm going to reveal now. Can you interpret the answer in a variety of ways? So was it a pig? Was it a cow? Was it a sheep? Could it have been anything? Was it uh, event-free survival? Those of us who work in cancer, I think a lot about event-free survival. Well, what do we, do we mean by an event? Are we just going to keep analyzing the data and say, oh, no, don't count that as an event. That's not, that's not really to do with this disease or this uh, treatment. Don't count that as an event. So take that one out. Are we just going to keep looking and looking and looking and interpret it in a way that we wish to interpret it? And, it may, and again, this is a big challenge if we're trialists. We maybe believe that our intervention really works. So what's gone wrong in our trial when it doesn't work? Maybe we should have another look at the data because it really must work. So we could be very enthusiastic and just feel something went wrong. We really should have another look. We really should redefine that a particular outcome. We have to remember all the time as trialists, outcomes are what are going to give us the result of the trial. And if we can start saying, that's a cow, no, it's a sheep, no, it's a pig, well, we can just keep going. <coughs> and it's the same thing. That didn't change. Can you manipulate the data until you get what you want? Can I take out the number three? Can I just keep rummaging around in the data until it suddenly says to me, here's your answer, show this one. And it's not difficult to do that if we have a, a, some statistical analysis package. We can tell the computer to analyze and analyze and analyze the data and to only show us the significant findings or to show us the most significant finding. And at this point, we've got absolutely no idea how many analyses were done. The computer just trawled through the data trying to find interesting things. We were manipulating it. In that, and this, this takes us to this point. As well, this is an important point. Why are we doing a subgroup analysis? Many times we do a subgroup analysis because maybe we're thinking <coughs> it must work for some, maybe it doesn't work for others. But we should also be saying, sometimes we're doing them, to say, be reassured. We've had a look in the different ages and there is no reason to believe that the ages are different. This is what you, you'll see from these pictures now is what we have to think about. So this one, we could come away from that feeling very reassured. Overall, there's a benefit of treatment. In subgroup one, there's a benefit of treatment. Again, you're just thinking, does it touch the line of no difference? It's confidence interval. No, it doesn't. Does it touch? No, it doesn't. So we can come away from that thinking, it works. Whether or not man or woman, it works. But what we have to think very hard about is if we don't hit that circumstance, how are we going to interpret it? And when we're thinking about subgroups, we use these, sometimes use these terms. They're not how we would usually use these terms in um, research in general. A quantitative interaction in a subgroup analysis is basically saying, I think the size of the effect will be different in the different subgroups, but I think if there's a benefit, there'll be a benefit in each subgroup. 
and a qualitative interaction, which is quite unusual in healthcare, is saying it will work for some people and it will harm others. That this, in, this treatment, this type of physiotherapy will get these people back to work quicker, but it will actually delay these people from getting back to work. So you need quite a special rationale and it's quite a special underpinning for that, for a qualitative interaction. And so we just need to be careful that we don't believe that there is one once we start smashing our data apart. So that's back to, that's a, the most straightforward quantitative interaction. There's a, there's a benefit in both groups. The benefit is clear, statistically significant in both groups, consistent with the overall results. That's, that's, an, that's a great one. That's an easy one. That's a qualitative one. That overall, there seems to be a benefit. But actually, one subgroup is benefiting greatly, much better than the average, and the other subgroup has actually gone onto the harm side. And if we see a result like that, we have to be saying to ourselves, not just, why is this so wonderful for this group? And occasionally trialists will get themselves hung up on why is it so great here? What's the rationale? And they'll come up with a rationale you really should be thinking about what's the rationale for that one to have gone harmful? Because maybe they just separated by chance. And an important point with these analyses is that what we should be doing is saying, is that result different to that result? And on this example, they're miles apart. They are very different. This is not just chance moving them apart. So we'd have to explore why. What has moved them apart? But then we have to say to ourselves, what is the most reliable evidence to make a decision <coughs> about the care or the treatment of an individual patient. Is it the overall average, or is it the, the result that is similar to that patient's characteristics? It's a tough ask, and there isn't an easy answer. This is the sorts of circumstances that as trialists we face and as reviewers we face a great deal. We see this result. Overall, benefit. Subgroup two, benefit. Subgroup one, not significant. What we desperately do not want to do when we see that result is make the mistake that we might have made with the nine subgroups and say, well, it's not, clearly, you know, it's not proven for subgroup one. What we should be doing, and the mathematics can help us with this, is saying, is there any reason to believe that subgroup one and subgroup two are fundamentally different in their result? And we do a little mathematical test, and on an example like this, we'd almost certainly say, those groups have just moved apart by chance. One has gone a bit more favourable, one has gone a bit less favourable, but they're both completely consistent with there being an overall benefit. And why this is important for practitioners is that this one, if you believed it's not proven yet, you might be denying subgroup one patients an effective treatment. Or you might be saying subgroup one, we need to do another trial and half of them won't receive it. There is no reason to believe on a picture like this one, and these are all made up pictures, they're not real, real trials or real reviews. There is no reason to believe on this picture that subgroup one don't benefit. That every reason to believe that subgroup one, the best estimate for subgroup one is probably that overall. Another one where we may be not quite so sure now. We've got overall benefit, it's coming primarily being driven by one big benefit in one small population. We've got a very big population, and the size of the blue square is a guide to, that's a big population. There's a big lump of people in that study. Then it's a sort of guide to thinking, hmm, maybe we should just be careful that this result is not actually being dragged by that one. They're not, there are no easy answers to this. And these are just, simply showing these, because these are the dilemmas we face when we analyze our trials and our reviews. And what we ideally would be looking for is why did we do that subgroup analysis? What was our rationale for doing it? What was our prediction? Is this consistent with other evidence? If we don't have any other information to support what's going on there, then maybe the most likely explanation is just chance. Which is again one of the, strength, you know, the things that trying to get out to, in, in the talk is the sense that chance is a lot more powerful than most people give it credit for. Chance can drive all sorts of things that end up being explained by biological rationales, which if someone came into the room the next day and said, oh, sorry, got those the wrong way around, the labels are wrong, subgroup one and subgroup two, I mixed up the labels, 
then you know, within another 30 seconds you've come up with a rationale for why the first rationale was wrong and actually it's, a, it's clearly 